Where theme park families Theme park families Where theme park families Won't you join us now? Where theme park families Thanks for joining us, we aim to please if roller coasters got you weak in the knees We're theme park families If you want to find the best dessert or Take a party break with privacy Or find a coaster that is tame for little ones Or one to make you scream Thanks for joining us for episode three. I'm Adam. And I'm Andrew. And today we have a very special episode for you. It has been a whirlwind last two weekends, two long weekends to say the least. Have those been two of the best weekends of your short eight years, Andrew? Probably. And they also felt like the longest two weekends of my life. Have you recovered yet sleep-wise? Uh, no, I'm still a little bit tired, but um, I'm okay. Well, these last two weekends have been incredible. Stretching back two weeks ago, we had the Coaster Radio meetup at Carowinds, which was just amazing. On the drive back up north, we stopped at King's Dominion for a special treat with some In The Loop guys, and then stopped off at Dorney Park, where Andrew was able to do his first 52-inch coaster. But we'll talk about all of that next week when we get back to our normal format. Today... We're going to be talking about what, bud? We're going to talk about Holiday World and Halloween Night. It'll be a very special episode. What an amazing time. And we have so much to talk about with last weekend, Holiday World and Hollywood Nights, that we are going to get away from our traditional format, even though it's only been how long that we've done that traditional format? Uh, well, we've done it one episode. <laughs> one episode. But there's so much to talk about that we're going to get back to that in our next episode. So what we're going to do, since we have so much to talk about here, we're going to release two episodes here in the next couple days. Uh, so we'll do one episode on Holiday World and Hollywood Nights, and then talk about all that other stuff as well and get back to our tips of the week and our ride of the week and all those other things and what else that's important to you oh well you can't forget andrew's news i mean come on <laughs> andrew's news woo so today we'll be talking exclusively about Hollywood world hollywood nights and a very special treat where we had an interview with four of the members of the holiday world podcast or ho wo po as they are affectionately named. So we'll get to that a little bit later. Before we really get into the episode, we want to send out a big thanks to a few friends of the show, Julian Dalton and Kevin Wilson, who lent us their considerable vocal talents last week for the Carowind skit from episode two. They really stole the show, so thanks a lot, guys, for helping us out there. Okay, so now to get into Holiday World. Before we went, what did you really know about the park itself? Well, I knew that it had four great coasters there. I mean, they were fantastic. Um, we have Thunderbird, Voyage, Raven, and of course, The Legends. And so you knew about all of those before we went? Yeah, I did my research. <laughs> of course, as I would expect. And you knew they had a pretty good water park? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, I really wanted to go into this trip with not knowing everything about the park. I wanted to experience it with new, fresh eyes. Years ago, we had taken a look at the POVs. But other than that, I really didn't know much about it. So I was really excited to go. And it's kind of a special thing for a lot of enthusiasts who go to a lot of parks. They might not get to experience a new park all that often. It really is a special treat to see someplace new. So I was really excited about that. To let you know, if you've never heard of Hollywood Nights and what it is... We'll just give you a really brief description of what the event is. So Hollywood Nights is a coaster enthusiast event where it takes place over a stretch of two days 
and it gives special time for coaster enthusiasts who are either members of a club, uh, different clubs like Ace, and I think there was one called the Western New York Coaster Club, and there are a number of others. Uh, Ohio has a coaster club as well, and it gives them access to certain parts of the park that the general public don't have, as well as giving them ERT, or exclusive ride time, for some of the coasters at later on in the park when the park is closed. My wife Melissa reminded me to state what some of this jargon means, that not uh, there might be some new listeners here. So I think getting into next week, we're going to have a, a part of Mom's Musings where she's going to be talking about some of that jargon and basic information, coaster types, coaster companies. Melissa, thankfully, stated we could go to this event and we ordered tickets immediately. And it's such a bargain, not to get into prices here, but it was so incredibly affordable for anyone. You had options whether to get a one day pass, two day, one and a half. And since we had a long drive ahead of us, we knew we wanted to do two full days, especially our first time there. So we purchased the two day ticket, but what a great value considering it includes two full days in the park and that extra time, as well as snacks and a few meals as well. What a great value, unbelievable in that way. Our family is not a member of a coaster club yet. That's something that we can consider in the future. But as long as you are friends with someone who is in a coaster club and can vouch for you, that was enough to also get into the event. So we drove that first night, Thursday night, to the Columbus area to split it and make it not so long of a drive as it was about 11 hours for us. Woke up early in the morning from that area, drove, and got to the park, I'd say about 40 minutes after opening. They opened at 10, and we were helped by that time change as it is in central time zone, very, very close to eastern time zone. So that helped us out to get there only about a half hour after its opening. Really cool experience getting to the park as you get off the exit of the highway and you drive for a little bit through beautiful farm fields and all of a sudden out of nowhere these coasters pop up and what was that site like for you oh it was crazy so in the front you can see raven and thunderbird mm -hmm. then uh, behind a couple of trees you can see voyage and now the water park is hidden so you can't see anything of that and you can't really see any of legends yeah definitely a little bit further back from the road it's like this field of dreams moment. Uh, if you build it, they will come where it just pops out of nature there. And it was very cool. In some ways, kind of like going to Knoebel. So when we drove, we entered into the legend lot. And the lot wasn't terribly busy at that point since it was so early. And we were able to pull up pretty close. Now, just to let new people know who are going to the park who've never been there, the Raven lot is on the same side of the park. And if you get there early, you can park pretty close to the gates. With the Legend lot that's on the other side of the street, it's not too bad as you park and then you can go underneath the tunnel and then get to the park. It's not that long of a walk. Well, first impressions are always so important, as I'm sure anyone at Holiday World would tell you. One of the first things that we see on a high lift in the parking lot is security managing the parking lot. And I thought that was such a great thing. We hear so many stories from huge chain parks of multiple cars getting broken into and security being so lax. So just seeing someone there, having that presence hovering in a very tall lift like that, I thought that was a very cool thing to see, very reassuring that, you know, your park's going to be okay. Yeah, and when we were walking back from the first day, I thought it was my funny that I think both of you guys, my mom and my dad, said that, what if he needs to go to the bathroom? <laughs> and, um, well, just go for the guy. You just need to lower the lift and go to a porta potty. Yeah, I'm sure they'll allow them to do that. That would be a pretty interesting job, and certainly a job for someone who doesn't have a fear of heights. Getting into the park didn't take that long, and once we were in, the first thing that we were greeted with was which land? Uh, we went to Christmas land first. It's such a nice way to be greeted as right there, the famous Santa Claus where people take pictures, the beautiful Christmas tree. One of the coolest things that you experience, and I had no idea that this was going to be there, is what do you hear when you travel to each land? 
on the speakers, you hear music seem to land. Like, if you're in Christmas land, you'd hear Christmas music. Or if you're in the Halloween land, you'd hear spooky Halloween music. <laughs> and it's so cool. It really sets that mood, doesn't it? Yeah, and like at night, when we're at Hollywood Nights, it's even spookier because it's like dark and spooky and nobody's around. So you hear that music and you think it's not supposed to be there and like it just feels like a haunting feeling it's a really cool thing and just one of those details that makes holiday world so special i've never experienced a 90 degree day and heard the song walking in a winter wonderland after walking through christmas land we met a bunch of our friends who had gotten there early friends that we've made through the coaster communities including coaster radio and we met up with brian julie goliath Tom and Kelly, and we started to go through some of the coasters. First off, we started with... We started with Raven. Raven, then we headed to... Legend. And then to... And then to... The Voyage. And after that... We went to Thunderbird. And we'll discuss those coasters in detail when we talk about the ERT at night, because I think that's when a lot of these coasters really shine, so we'll talk about them later. But we got a couple of rides in on each to really get the feeling... And after the coasters, I had one ride on Gobbler's Getaway. I think Alex and Goliath went on about 12 times in a row. What a great ride. We're used to boo blasters at a lot of the Cedar Fair parks, and it's always expected that a certain percentage of the animatronics aren't working or the guns don't work, and they work perfectly. And the scores you can rack up on that were amazing. The animatronic in the queue line was so well done. Very realistic, and I thought it was a great setting in the, uh, in the rocking chair and the fireplace. So very, very cool. I wish I had more time to do it. With uh, the cat, the old lady was... Ca- uh, was. Oh, there was a cat? Yeah, there was a cat. So you notice way more details than I do. Uh, between me watching uh, different kids and all that, I didn't even notice it. So that's uh, very cool. So cat lovers, I'm sure, love the ride. In the midst of that day, I noticed a couple of different shows going on. Did you notice any as we were walking around? Yeah, well, when we were in Christmas Land Uh with Brian and Julie, Mm -hmm. and when we were walking by, we saw Santa, and there's a little mini stage where he has his little chair on the stage, and he was telling stories to kids, and I thought that was really cool. Because he was um, also singing, and I just thought it was super cool that they did that. Yeah, I agree. What a wonderful touch. Having Santa Claus reading to the kids. And from when I watched them, a couple of times I walked past, the kids were enthralled and paying attention and were so excited. I think I might have even heard Santa singing at some point. So that was one of the shows that you saw. I noticed when we were online for The Raven one of the times... There was a diving show going on. Did you see any of that? Yeah, I saw a little bit. When we were walking in line, I kind of wish we stopped and watched more. But, you know, we're coaster enthusiasts, so we care more about the coasters than the shows. So I thought the neat part about it was, so this guy did this dive, and he had, like, fire on him. (laughs) And I thought that was really cool. Dressed all in black with fire parted suit. It did look pretty neat diving into the water completely lit on fire. I agree if we had gone for four or five days we would have watched a lot more of the shows. I noticed another show where there was singing and acrobats and ironically the song that was being sung was This Girl Is On Fire sort of connected to the diving show there. I've heard great things about the shows. If we had more time we definitely would have watched those. At that point in time, it was already late afternoon on that Friday, so we decided to head to Lake Rudolph Camping Grounds to set up our tent as we had reserved a tent site and set up our tent before it got late and we had time to get dressed and put on our bathing suits for nighttime ERT at the water park. What did you think of the campground? I think it was cool. We had a very good campsite where we had plenty of space and we had a little creek next to us so the grounds were really really nice what a huge place and one of the advantages of staying there is that it is so close the two properties literally border each other so after spending potentially 10 11 12 hours in a park it's nice not to have to drive a half hour to get to your hotel or in this case campground plus they run a shuttle right from the park to the campground so that's really nice and convenient to do 
after setting up our camp, got into our bathing suits and headed back over to Holiday World for nighttime ERT. We get to the water park and the evening meal and we're greeted by the most jovial, happiest T-Rex that you'd ever seen. High-fiving everyone, dancing. It was such a treat to have. And they were playing Jurassic Park music over the speakers, which just added to how cool this was. We didn't even talk about that theme yet. Jurassic Park. A great little pun. A nice take on Jurassic Park. So everything involved was sort of dinosaur-themed. The meal itself, so creative, where you, we didn't have chicken wings, we had pterodactyl wings, and they had different concoctions as well, also themed to dinosaur-related things. One of the snacks was like a paleontologist dig, where they had mashed potatoes and some type of pork in different layers, like you were digging to find your fossils. It was very cool. So that was very well done, and we had a wonderful meal. So then it was time for the event. And there were three different rides open on that Friday night for the first part of the ERT in the water park. And they were... Wildebeest, Mammoth, and Zimbabwe. Andrew and I have had one experience on a water coaster, and that was two years ago. Do you remember what that was? Um, It was Bootleggers Run at Splish Splash. Yeah, Bootleggers Run. A tiny little water coaster. It was fine, but barely an appetizer compared to what we experienced here. If these were the only two rides in this water park, it would make it one of the best water parks we've ever been to. To have ERT on these were amazing. So we started the day off on which one? We started off with Wildebeest. Wildebeest was our first one. And we rode these with Ariel, Slater, and Goliath, and a number of other of their friends as well. And so it was already getting a little bit later at that point. It was starting to cool down, and we did Wildebeest. And Wildebeest has the longer, skinnier rafts that seat four people at a time. What did you think of the ride? Oh, I was the best out of the two. I love the airtime. I won't spoil it for you that haven't done it yet, but I loved it. It was my favorite. And it's amazing how long it seemed to be. The tunnels that dove underground were such a pleasurable treat. I didn't watch POVs of this at all, so I had no idea that those were coming. And the water was a little brisk and just amazing. So much speed. Uh, Three or four times where you feel like you were completely lifting off the ground. Such a great ride. Yeah, just incredible. So we loved it. Then we headed over to Mammoth. Mammoth has the different rafts where they're circular, so you're all facing each other. That element of it I loved. So much more of a social experience, as you know, oh, who's going backwards, who's going forwards, who's going to get splashed more? It really kind of made it a very different experience. Now, what was the difference in water temperatures? Oh, jeez. It was super cold. But what were you wearing? I was wearing a wetsuit, so (laughs) that wasn't as bad as some people. Yeah. These two little guys, Andrew and Alex, they tend to get a little bit chillier in water parks, so I had wetsuits on them. So it seems like the best time to do Mammoth would be the middle of a really hot day. How much that would cool you off and and really be refreshing. Amazing some of the drops. I know it has the longest uphill stretch on a water coaster of any by far. That one that you're lifted up, it feels like you're going up forever. And it's such a great incline. And then I think of the two, it actually has the better finish. That last turn into that last drop, it is amazing how big that splash is and you just get absolutely soaked. Hey, so, spoiler alert. Well, I'm giving a little preview. I'm not giving up the whole gist of the ride, but I think that that finish is just awesome. The audience doesn't know exactly what happens. They just have a feel for it. It's a great finish. So totals, we did Mammoth. Do you remember how many times that night? Uh, we did it two times. Mm-hmm. One was... The whole group, including Alex, and one with just a couple of people. Which was great. And then we finished off on Wildebeest, and that crew was so friendly. The girl, she even asked, oh, where are you guys from? It doesn't sound like you're from these parts. And uh, we, t- we told them where we're from and, and had a nice little conversation while we were waiting. And then we did it. I think about four times in a row at the end of the night. And they let us go on the rides a little bit past our allotted time. They were just so friendly about it. But the ride was just so amazing. We wanted to keep going over and over and over and over again. So after that, the evening ERT for the water rides was done. And I think that was 6 to 8, 6.30 yeah, to 8.30, something like that. Yeah, 6 to 8. Okay. Yep. And to the GP, it closes at 6. 
That night, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think it usually closes at 6. Yeah, it's possible that more in the middle of summer, it might be a little bit later, uh, yeah. 7 o'clock, I think, some nights. And so we got dressed, put on our clothes, put our wet stuff into the car, and got ready for nighttime ERT on the coasters. And this is where things got really, really interesting. We did the same order. First, we went back to the Raven. What an experience. And this is why stop looking at statistics. I was as guilty as anyone else, where with coasters in that first two years, I would really look at, oh, how tall is it? How fast is it? And this is where you throw all of that out the window. Raven, to me, was such a surprise. That lift hill is less than 100 feet. The first drop was less than 100 feet. Does that mean it was a tame coaster? No, I would say it was third and most intense out of them. And so the lift hill, not that tall. A great first drop, especially at night. You go through a tunnel, uh, another drop, and then... There's one of the most intense moments with that curve over the lake. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's cool to see, like, the lake out in the distance and how far it banks is, it's, I love it. I mean, can get a little rattly, but it's still a great little turn there. And that's what a lot of wooden coaster fans love about it, that type of intensity. After that, there's a bigger drop, which is just amazing. And it was really cool. At the end of the night, we did four Ravens in a row. And there was a coaster enthusiast who knew this ride so well who was in front of us. And he did this very poetic dance move where he'd put his hands together in front of him. And then as that drop happened, he would spread his hands out to the side and then lift them up into the air. And it did the same exact thing every time. Such a cool routine that some people have. And as the ride goes on, it seems to get faster and faster and faster. And Raven is the most in the trees of the three of them. And you feel like you have no idea where you're heading. It's such an incredibly intense ride. You get to the ending and your breath is just taken away. And so don't follow statistics. In this case, statistics do not mean anything anything with the Raven. So next we did the legend. And what did you think about the legend? Very interesting. Well, for people that are really, really into coasters, they would disagree with me. I think legend is the best coaster they have there. Not because of the elements, because of how intense it is. Do you think it's the best or is it your favorite? Uh, my favorite, but the best is Probably the Voyage. Well, interesting. And that's always an interesting discussion with enthusiasts. What's your favorite versus what's the best? And so what did you really like about the legend? Well, I liked the legend. The first drop was unique, the little curve uh, with the tunnel. And I love the Helix. The Helix had the two tunnels. And it was probably my second favorite Helix. Nice and intense. And I love the curve under the water part. You do get a little wet. I call it a water coaster. Effect on that one, yeah. What an incredible ride that is. At night especially, those tunnels are so dark you cannot see your hand in front of your face. It adds to the excitement of what is going to happen next. As If you haven't memorized the ride, you don't know which way you're going next. And, and that was just so exciting. Loved it. And what a great ride. Then we went to the voyage. And I think we'll talk about it at the end as we had a very special moment on the voyage later on. One thing on all the coasters that became very noticeable were the ride operators. The job that they did to get those trains out as quickly as they could. They understand how much the enthusiasts love those rides. And did you notice that some of them were sprinting to their positions after they checked all the seatbelts? Yeah, like um, this one guy on our nighttime rides on a Raven, he was like sprinting and, and I could tell he was really into his job. I mean, he was one of those great workers there that people have been telling us about and it just adds to that very good experience. You can tell how much they care, that they wanted to get those trains out so quickly and it's amazing how many rides you could get in that night. We can talk about Thunderbird now and Thunderbird was Andrew's second 52-inch coaster that he ever did. And so what did you think about Thunderbird? The launch is awesome. It has the most graceful loop and barrel rolls that I've ever felt 
on a coaster. I mean, it's just so smooth and gentle. I mean, it's not like Legend where it's super forceful, but the launch, now the launch is probably the most forceful launch I've done behind back a lot and a couple others mm-hmm. that we'll mention on a couple other shows. I thought that was incredible. And I want to say the launch was the best part of the ride, but I want to say the ending is the best part of the ride. Did you like the, the fly-throughs the, through the barn and, and all that? I mean, yeah, it was cool. Uh, good theming. Those were some good leg choppers. Yeah, exactly. Love the leg choppers, where it looks like you're about to hit a post or something like that, and instinctually you lift your legs up when, of course, there was no danger there. So I agree. I love those as well. What a terrific ride. So smooth. uh, Just wonderful elements. So well paced. And it was so exciting to get front row so that you'd have those great visuals. So that rounded out our first night, and we got a number of rides on every single coaster. By then, we were pretty tired. That was a really long day day but a wonderful day and we were excited to get some sleep so that we could experience from opening to close again day two we didn't really know that we were definitely coming to hollywood nights till only a couple of weeks before the event and so i knew we were starting out our podcast and i sent paul an email explaining that we were a new podcast that we'd only have a couple episodes in that we were so excited to come to holiday world for the first time and would it be possible to interview her or someone else to just learn a little bit more about the Park. She immediately emailed us back saying she'd be more than delighted and and then a couple days later stated, how about if you interview all of us from the Holiday World podcast uh, or at least a number of the members, everyone who is going to be there. And I was floored. Here, she decided to put trust in us and so happy they were able to do this. So to split the two days up now, we're going to play the interview that we did on the second night of ERT. This was from Saturday Night. We'll talk about the interview afterwards. Enjoy. See you later. This is Adam. And Andrew. From Theme Park Families. And we are so excited to be here at Hollywood Nights. Our first time for a wonderful experience here at Holiday World and Splash and Safari. And we are so excited to have President and CEO Matt Eckert. Owner Leah Cook. Director of Attractions, Eric Rentz, and Director of Communications, Paul Awarney. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for being with us. Oh, absolutely. That's terrific. Well, normally, with a podcast like this, we would be so interested in, in talking about rides and attractions, but a very unique experience where I think we have to ask about employees before anything else, because I think that's what's been so startling to us, the level of service. And without going into any industry secrets, we just wonder, the hiring and training process, what makes it so incredibly different where the surface is just so amazing Uh, it's just been incredible and so noticeable how different it's been sure so i mean our hiring process is is very challenging given where we're located Mm -hmm. you know we're in a town of 2500 people um so we draw from a you know pretty good distance away we have buses that actually go out and bring employees to us um and you know what i've been telling people you know everyone keeps asking like how do you get such friendly employees and you know my answer is i think it's partially just where we're from you know i think we just have that you know southern indiana hospitality where we've been raised with the yes ma'ams and no ma'ams and the thank yous and the pleases and you know we're very very blessed so um, but it, it is a challenge i think eric can probably speak to that too you know we go from 100 full-time employees to about 2300 employees in the matter of a couple months and so that's that's definitely something that we you know find challenging every year it's sort of like thunderbird a launch coaster going from zero to right. super fast super quickly right. yeah right. you were going to follow up on that eric yeah it's like matt said we do a lot we do a lot of thinking outside the box the bus program we have is great brings people from um, other areas since we are kind of in the middle of a cornfield yeah um, and I think just being in this in this region of the nation the, the kids are very friendly and we have a very friendly staff that um, works hard you know as a team and a family so it's a, it's a unique region we're in too oh absolutely I think for the most part too if you're a surly person by nature who's not customer friendly, mm-hmm. would you want to come work in a town called Santa Claus? Oh, gosh. I mean, come on. <laughs> so I think we attract the right kind of people who are people pleasers and who like to meet people from all over the world. So that, that helps, too. And and I think, too, the people who really enjoy working at a theme park, we think that's the coolest summer job ever. And it's, it's great that we can provide those jobs because there's lots of communities that, that don't have that around the yeah. world. Oh, just remarkable. Absolutely. Second question. Could you set some light on why Hollywood Nights was created and how it was evolved over the years? 
Oh my goodness. That's a it deep question. It started yeah. back in 1995, last century. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. You, you remember that? Right? So, yeah. I know, you feel kind of yeah. old. But we, we, that was the year we oh, opened great. the Raven, our first wooden roller coaster. So you've ridden that, right? Mm. Yes, wow. many yes. times. Very good. <laughs> and we had the American Coaster Enthusiasts out to visit us on May 19th, which I remember because that was my birthday. Oh. And they came out and had a conference with us and rode the Raven and loved it. And they brought CBS News with them, if you can believe. Remember 48 oh. Hours? Oh, absolutely. And they had done a whole hour-long um, report about thrill seekers and what makes people thrill seekers. And they wanted to do a portion about roller coasters. And so they came to... Uh, Try out the Raven. So it was it was such an exciting time, and there was so much enthusiasm, and people were hooting and hollering and clapping, and you know, kind of like what you hear in the background right now. <laughs> yes, there is no enthusiasm right. like the coaster enthusiast. And I remember when they left the next day, I, I turned to to Leah's dad, Will Cook, and said, "We have to do this again." I was yeah. just like, "We we can't," because the next day people were riding and having fun, but they weren't screaming and yelling and clapping and, and just going crazy about it. And so that August, we started what was then called Stark Raven Mad. Mm -hmm. So that was our very first event. Wow. And we've been doing it ever since. We, we changed it to Hollywood Nights uh, back when we added other wooden coasters. And then when we added Thunderbird, we thought, what the heck, we like Hollywood Nights. We'll just we'll leave, the, leave the name alone. <laughs> well, it's just been amazing. Even uh, to the first meal where all of the things were themed. I mean, that's so cute, the pterodactyl wings and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's just such a cute detail. Which you could have just put out regular wings and not put anything in it, but it's those little details that make such a big difference. We're Pretty impressive. We gotta and, and, and that is awesome, right? You look, you love theming. That's your thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Leah, you know, we have a water park that's considered one of the best in the nation, if not the best. And as far as I'm concerned, it's by far the best. Uh, and we have a dry park with four coasters that are ranked in the top 100. So that must mean there must be two exorbitant fees to go to each park, right? Two different fees. You would think that, right? You would think that, but you'd be wrong. Two parks for one price, and not only do we have that, but we have free and limited soft drinks, free and limited sunscreen, free parking, free Wi-Fi. It's I'm very proud of the value package that we have here. <laughs> it really is amazing. And adding all those things together makes it incredible. And Andrew, I was thinking it, but Andrew said it to me. What did you say about this park? And I didn't mention anything to you. What, what did you say? I said it was probably the best park I've ever been to. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Before he said it, it was definitely settled in my mind. And that was after only being here for about two hours, right, buddy? Yeah, wow. yesterday. Yeah, exactly. So, so you still feel that way, right? Yep. Even, even more so as it's settled in your mind. New for this year is Firecracker the Calypso, mm -hmm. and listening to that episode from Ho O Po, just <laughs> the, absolutely the greatest uh, abbreviation of all time, <laughs> it really sounded like you guys were just doing a Lego experiment. Like uh, the, uh, you were having so much fun just breaking it down, finding it, putting it back together. It's almost yeah. like that was part of the excitement, more uh, more so than even just having a ride. Was it that fun to do the whole thing? Yeah, that you know. It there's a lot of pride in it and the team that took it took it down and put it back together and worked on the ins and outs of it we spent a lot of time working through the manual and and coming up with the requirements so it was it was like putting a puzzle together and there was a lot of ownership in it it felt like truly like we did something really great with our you know our own two hands so that was really impressive there being no manual there it being possibly a combination of two companies right. possibly yeah. not sure maybe that's just an amazing process uh, that you did this uh, it's a very fascinating email yeah. exchange yeah Oh, I could imagine. <laughs> yeah. yep, yep. And then hearing about the lights and finding car lights, it was just uh, such a unique process. It was truly a labor of love, and I think that's what makes me so proud about the project, too, is just the fact that we did the majority of this project all on our own with our own guys and our own staff. And, they did um, such a good job. And they did such a good job. I mean, you can you know, look at it, and it's, it's, it's something we're very proud of. Yeah, yeah. And it's beautiful. It really is. We've seen a few other Calypsos, but this is just stunning. Between the lights, as in the title that you guys came up with for that episode... <laughs> It really is kind of stunning. It's pretty amazing to see a major theme park with snow coasters that have a height requirement that's for 54-inch riders. Is that always a consideration when picking your riders? 
to accommodate younger enthusiasts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We always kind of try to think about that when we're building rides, trying to figure out what the height requirement is going to be and what family members are going to be able to ride when we build. And so that's definitely a consideration that's very important to us. We want to make sure we can get as many people on as we can, and we want people to be able to enjoy as many attractions as they can as a family. But that said, with Thunderbird, when we built that, yep. we had to allow a certain height requirement there, um, but... I think that's still, it's still, it's still not, not 54. 54. It's still yeah. not 54. But, um, and for someone like Andrew yeah. at his size, yeah. that makes a big yeah. difference, those two inches. Right, yeah. right. Yep. And so we had, we had to accept that one, but I think... Hopefully you'll agree it was worth it. <laughs> well, oh, undoubtedly worth it. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing because uh, you know it's such a family friendly park, and then uh, you look at those three wooden coasters and you think, oh, it's going to be family friendly, Holiday World and Kitty. But wow, are those coasters something? Boy, they really pack a punch. It's pretty amazing. Right. I remember when we opened. Yeah. Raven. I guess I'm the only one who was here then. <laughs> I, don't know. I was here. You yeah. Were here. In, a, in a different and capacity. And actually talking about high restrictions, I'm going to tell a story <laughs> oh, yes. about Leah. When um, Leah and her, well, William was too little then to ride. Uh-huh. But, but her, her older sister Lauren yeah. and her mom and they all came out to ride. And originally Raven's height restriction was going to be 44 inches, I believe. And <laughs> Leah was tall enough to ride, but was so scared. Yeah. She kind of melted. She kind of, yeah. and it scared her dad. Yeah. Will was like, we need to take, and she was still tall enough to ride it at 48 inches, but he just thought, you know, if little ones are yeah. just a little too small to ride, this is yeah. more of a thrill ride than we yeah. really knew it was going to, we did not know it was going to be this much of a thrill ride. We we kept <laughs> calling it a family ride, yeah. and then when we rode it, it's like, yeah. oh, okay, we need to rewrite yeah. some of the yeah. copy here. Yeah, just that turn over the lake alone yeah. Uh, yeah. is is so thrilling and awesome. And then that's part of what our podcast is about, is helping uh, new riders and, yeah. and new experiences, so that progression working their way up. So, uh, what, what a great ride Raven is, to say the least. Oh, and by the way, I love the music. <laughs> oh, throughout the whole theme park? Oh, not only the Jurassic Park, I mean, just another one of those touches. Is, yeah. that, is that what you were referring to? Uh, well, or just well, in every land? Yeah, I, I mean, another great touch, Jurassic Park, but when you go through each land, I wasn't expecting that. And, you know, just learning new things about the park and having the different music, just a brilliant touch. It really is impressive. I've heard that there is a room for kids and families who need a little break. Can you tell us about that? That is new this year. And if you think of sensory overload, which I think all of us have experienced, and for some, especially smaller individuals, younger individuals, you need a little break from that. And never do you get more sensory overload than in an amusement park. (laughs) Absolutely. That's for sure, because we have the sights and the sounds and the smells and lots of people. And so this year we added a calming room. It's part of our first aid building, which is centrally located in the park. And you can sign up and make a reservation for a half hour time that you can go during the day and just cool off and quiet down. You can adjust the lights, you can adjust the music, you can sit in a little tent or sit in beanbag chairs or rocking chairs and bring, if you want to bring your own books or toys or something, but just to have a nice quiet time and then go back out in the park and have more fun. Well, what a brilliant idea. Andrew could absolutely stay in a park from open to close, never have a problem. Alex, uh, my, our younger son, who's a little bit more susceptible to loud noises, mm-hmm. that's a, per- yeah. a perfect kind of thing for him. So uh, just another example of how great the park is. Well, we thank you for being so generous uh, with your time. We just want uh, to ask one more question, uh, since there's so much still to do tonight. As a new podcaster, we were wondering about yours. Why did you start it? And does the pod squad really have that much fun? <laughs> okay. So, so we'll, we'll go down the road. Well, I uh, we do have a lot of fun. We, it really is genuine, and there's yeah. a good connection. And when we get together, it's kind of a fun time for us all to get back every two weeks. So I love it. And I know, Paul, I can talk to how it started. But it's kind of weird to hear that we're like this seasoned podcast. And like, you know, right? Giving some advice. <laughs> after, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, what, two and a half years approximately, right? One and a half. One and a half. One and a half. All right. Yeah. So it was winter 2000. Right. Okay, yeah. 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 So one and a half years. Yeah. The idea actually came from when we were working on plans for announcing Thunderbirds. So it was several years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. And every time we would be in a meeting with Matt, Lauren, and Leah especially, mm-hmm. it was like we couldn't stay on track because they were <laughs> we all were really excited they were so about excited. announcing it. Yeah. And they had so many ideas just kind of everywhere. 
are coming from every direction and <laughs> stories to tell. And I remember just saying in the middle of a meeting once, this is a podcast. And everybody looked at me like, yes, yeah, yeah, be quiet. And they went off to Whatever, other things. Paul. And I brought it up three or four times. But finally, when I came up with the idea to have a game at the end, because they know they're really, really competitive. And I remember I went and said, you guys, okay, I want to talk about this podcast idea again. I said, how about a game? And it's like, with prizes? Oh, Their eyes started glowing. Oh, and I thought, prizes. we got them. Oh, and prizes. the sound effects yeah. and all that for winners. That's just brilliant. It's <laughs> great. It's so much fun. But they mostly go into it with very little idea of what we're going to talk about, yep. which is great because it's also been great training for everybody for mm-hmm. interviews such as this yeah, yeah. because it really forces you to think on your feet. Spontaneity. And, and, it's it's huge. Spontaneity. Yep. and the yep. stories that have come up like Lauren Leah talking about you know growing up as memories, kids, yes. and Matt's had stories, and Eric's had stories that I'd never heard before. So it's it's great that you know we share stories, and it's it's very organic. It's not like it's scripted. I'm and the only one with a script. Well, yeah. to tie into that, Paula, it's not uncommon for us to sit down and right before we get started, we're just starting to banter, and we start telling a story, and Paula goes, "No, no, 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 yeah. no, yeah. no, yeah. no, yeah. 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 no, 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 no,
No, I haven't. So to be able to talk to the owner, CEO, head of communications, head of ride operations, it's just amazing. It was just such a great experience and wonderful to be able to talk to. And shout out to the Whole World Pole podcast. And we respectfully wanted them to publish their podcast first so they could talk about the whole experience first before we did. So now that they finished, uh, we were able to publish ours. A couple of congratulations that we need to state as well from their most recent podcast. Really exciting news. And we're so happy that this happened around the same time. If you haven't heard, they were voted by USCA Today as the number one best water park in the nation. Yeah. That's so exciting and so well-deserved. We're going to chat about that on day two as we had some great experiences there. Not only that, but also in USA Today, they were rated the number fourth best amusement park. That's remarkable. And I think as impressive as being number one best water park. When you think about how many gigantic theme parks there are out there, we have multiple coasters. It's so impressive that they got number four. But that seems so worthy to me. Yep. Also announced that they were voted by Consumer Digest as the best value park. And with so many incredible rides at such a great rate, it's impossible to argue with that. And then number four, the fact that they passed the Ellis audit that they had with a perfect score. Not surprising, but really, really well done. So four great accolades and congratulations. We're so happy for you guys. On today, too, and we decided that if we really wanted to be able to analyze the whole park, we needed to get to the water park and spend more time there than just that nighttime ERT. So we got there at opening and did a few things because the water park opens an hour later. And you guys did the log flume, Frightful Falls, and Andrew, Alex, and Melissa did it together as I hung out with Maddie, who's not tall enough for Frightful Falls. And you guys, I think, had a pretty good time. How wet did you get? We got a little wet. You don't get absolutely soaked. So if you want to get a little bit cooled down, but you don't want to get absolutely drenched, you should go to this log flume. Perfect. And, and I think that's what makes a good log flume. A refreshing little spritz, but you don't want your clothes to be soaked and your shoes to be soaked as if you have your regular clothes on. That would be a miserable rest of the day. So we went into the water park and we immediately set our things down at the Bahari Wave Pool. So Maddie and I hung out at the pool for a while. Melissa, who didn't do the two water courses the, the day before, were able to do them with Andrew before the lines got a bit longer and they went on a couple of times and had a lot of fun. So then Melissa, Andrew, and Alex went over to Zynga, their funnel slide, which is pretty massive, and had a great time on that. And this is one of the things that makes Holiday World and Splash and Safari a special place. A lot of these kind of rides like Odorongo, Zynga, Zimbabwe, Hyena Falls, it allows 42-inch riders. So those kids who are approximately around uh, potentially four, five, six years old, it allows them to do those kind of bigger water rides where a lot of major chain theme parks, they would all be 48-inch rides. But it's kind of nice that the little kids can do some things with a bit more thrill. And so Alex was really excited to be able to do those. So while Ms. Melissa and the boys were doing all of those rides, I was with little baby Maddie, who just turned two, and she had a great time at the Bahari Wave Pool, which is such a nice setting, a beautiful place for a wave pool. And we spent a good hour at Safari Sam Splashland. What a great little area for little kids. Anywhere between, I'd say, two and eight years old. Such a neat place for little kids to go. And after we were done with this water site that me, my mom, and my brother did, we went over to that kitty area. And I noticed that All the kids were having the time of their life. They were laughing and enjoying the slides. Maddie was enjoying them too. I went on with her, so everybody just loved it there. It's a perfect area where there are about 10 slides all right next to each other. All of them might be about 20 to 30 feet long, and it's the perfect little thrill. Water's not too deep for a little kid. The slides aren't too extreme, but they go a little bit quickly, and we had a great time there, and it was a great place to spend about an hour or so. After that, we went over to the Bahari River, which was really, really nice. And as I mentioned in the interview, so neat that they had different sized tubes, something no other park thinks of, and it was really nice that they could sit in a tube but not fall through. Really, really great time there. 
Then after that, Maddie was ready for a nap and Melissa was ready for a break. So Andrew, Alex, and I decided to walk over to Hyena Falls. And it's a little bit of a walk as you go from Pahari River and then you have to go underneath the voyage and head over to the ride, which is on the other side of the park, more towards Thunderbird. Great tip on a really busy summer day, especially on the weekend. During the busy peak hours, might be a good idea to go over to Hyena Falls. That's where there might be some shorter lines since it is a little bit out of the way. And there you can get on rides a little bit quicker. We had a great time on all four of the slides there, especially the one that has sort of like a little skate park element where you kind of go up a wall a little bit. And that was a nice element to that slide. And we spent a good, I'd say, 40 minutes doing those slides over and over and over again. Really nice complex. Really enjoyed it there. One of the things that I thought was really cool at Splash and Safari was that no other water parks had this. They had observation decks on a lot of their slides. Like, they had one on their funnel slide and one on Mammoth and plenty of others. I, I thought that was very cool. Yeah, I think that's something you don't see at many other parks. Oh, that's right. You went up to the bowl slide and watched that a little bit, too. Yeah. What a neat idea. Exactly. People who maybe don't want to get wet that day or know their friends are coming, they could go and check them out and, and watch them and see their reactions. So the water park, the lines weren't that busy that day, but we still didn't get onto all the different rides. There are so many slides there, it's amazing. And in one short stretch of five, six hours, it's just still hard to do all of them. There are that many things to do there. What a great place. There were two different walkbacks, which is where they take people in a special event, like here with a coaster event that we had at Hollywood Nights, and they can walk with a group leader and take pictures and go back in areas that normally the public wouldn't be able to and get some unique pictures of coasters in a place that they wouldn't normally get to. Since we were at the water park, we didn't do the first one, which was Legend and the Raven, but then we were able to do Thunderbird and the Voyage. And what did you think of that walk back? Oh, it was crazy. Just how close you get to the tracks is so cool. And to see the coaster coming by from that fast, it is just amazing. It was a really neat experience. You get some really, really cool views, including on the voyage one time where the coaster, it's like the second hill where it dips into a tunnel. So you get to watch it come at you, go into the tunnel, and then come out the other side. And there's, of course, a nacho bar. (laughs) Nacho bar right at the end of the tour. Really well done. Right next to the Thunderbird station there, just inside the fence beautiful nacho bar with uh, different proteins and it was nice Uh, people sat on the hillside in the grass and a nice place to chat sit in the shade and it was really really well done after that we decided it was time for maddie to do some rides as she loves it so we headed down to hollow dogs fun town what a cute little area what did you like about that place it was very exciting. They had a little play area. And with the slide and all that. Yeah, yeah. with the cool slide mm-hmm. and with the fountains. Now, a lot of kitty areas have the fountains. It's um nice and cool that they put a lot of other little kitty stuff like teapots. And they put a little um holly dog train. And also they had this little car thing where you had to... It wasn't you drive just around, it just, like, they, it took you on a little ride through... Through some trees, right? Through some trees, and it was just neat that they had a little section for kids. And what was so neat and original about the Hollow Dog Express? So, what was neat about the train was they had little fairy tale stuff, and the person at the front of the train, the worker there... It was so cool because they said little rhymes to the fairy tale, and I thought it was cool that they did that. And the enthusiasm. You could imagine she's probably done these rhymes as you go past the set pieces of all these fairy tales, like Little Jack Horner and a certain famous egg that fell off a wall. Yeah, the woman in the shoe, all of those. But her enthusiasm, it's like she did it for the first time. It was so cool to see that she still loved what she was doing, even if it was her first day. By that time of the day, she had done that plenty of times. So that was really, really fun, unique, and original. 
After doing a few of those rides, including Maddie getting onto the kitty tea party, which she loved and just loved spinning around and was giggling her head off, we headed off to the 4th of July section where Andrew, Alex, and Melissa were able to do the Liberty launch, which looked like a lot of fun. You guys, a lot of their time. Right at the top, right? It felt like you were going to fly off. That's what you said. You all did the Firecracker, which looked beautiful. Their new ride. I would definitely listen to that on the Holiday World podcast, that episode of what it took to put that together. Alex would have loved to do the Revolution. That's one of his favorite type of rides, but unfortunately we had no time as we had to head down to dinner in the good old times picnic grove where they had a really nice spread for us. We're announcing winners of different contests and that kind of thing. There was a lot of energy in the crowd. Eventually they cleared out the general public from the areas and we're ready for the nighttime ERT on the coasters. Right after we got out of dinner, that's when we did our interview. And again, on a busy night with them having so many responsibilities and talking to so many other people, it was really great that they gave us that time, and we are so appreciative of it. Well, then at that point, we headed over to the coasters, and this is where it gets interesting, as what was going on on the legend that night? They had this water cup challenge. I'll explain the rules. You went in with this cup, and you went in the exit, and they explained the rules to you, and you got your cup, you could fill it to the very top, and then you went into the station. Mm -hmm. And then you got on, and it was a wonderful experience. So I knew I couldn't sign up as I was with Alex at the time, and so Andrew was excited to do it. Now, he is a very competitive dude, and it has nothing to do with me. In all sports, he is determined to win, and as people were coming off the train, there were so many people who said, nope, I don't have a drop left, or oh boy, my method didn't work. So you had to put the cup on a body part. That was kind of hard. Some people put it on their leg or arm, and that might have been a little difficult for some people. I could see that being tough, and we're not going to give away any secrets, right, in case there's another competition in the future. No. But you found a body part that worked pretty well for you, huh? Yep. When you came off the ride, you presented your cup, and how did you do? Oh, I did horrible. Oh, no. Uh, And you were devastated? Oh, I was um, absolutely... Oh, well, I was absolutely sad. Oh, no, because how did you do? Great! <laughs> My cup was filled to the top. I was really surprised with how I did. I thought I would come back with uh, a couple of inches left, but I came up with a full cup back. It was fun. I would do it again next year. And the fact that you help your team win... I was very proud of you. Good job, buddy. Thanks. (laughs) So we did Raven and Legend a couple more times. So it all came down to the final rides of the night. And we've heard stories for a long time, for about a year, of legendary night rides on the voyage. And I've been having a friendly discussion over the last bunch of months between Dan Miller and myself over El Toro versus the voyage and i was a staunch defender of el toro it's what got us into the hobby it's a coaster we love and a very highly ranked coaster and i and i kept stating oh there's no way the voyage is going to be anywhere near as good that night everything changed and i can admit what i'm wrong that that is one of the most incredible experiences for coaster enthusiasts out there who've done Intimidator 305, but not The Voyage, Intimidator 305 is like a little baby kitty coaster compared to The Voyage at night. Some of you might be screaming right now, but I can believe him. I mean, I don't know if your opinion would change if they never took the trim brakes out. Aha, uh-huh, so let's explain that. Uh, very good. One of the differences in the voyage for Hollywood Night, about halfway through the ride, after the turnaround, after the turnaround, there's a section where you come to a tunnel, and there's a little break there which slows the train down for the second half of the ride. For Hollywood Nights, however, they turn the trim brake off. At that exact moment when you go past the trim brakes, it doesn't make a big difference there, but it's a cumulative difference as the ride just picks up more and more speed after that as you go towards the station. It's kind of a unique situation where the coaster first half goes 
uphill, but uses that big lift hill to generate most of the speed. And then the whole way back is downhill. Wow, that whole section is just so amazing coming back and so incredibly intense. And it leaves you speechless. When you're done, it's almost like you don't know what to say. It's just so overwhelming, so incredible, so intense. So Andrew and Alex and I did it about three times in a row. And then Andrew decided to take a little break. These are long days where we were in the hot sun and he wanted to sit on the bench. And I believe he did so with Goliath. So Alex and I went back up and it's his favorite ride by far. He loves the voyage. And Alex is six years old, a <laughs> pretty young dude. So Alex and I wound up doing it at night eight times in a row. And everyone was pretty amazed that he was able to do this. From Coaster Studios, we had Taylor who was sitting behind us. And after about the fourth or fifth time, he's like, what is this little guy doing? How is he doing this? And Alex said, the coaster is giving me energy. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes from the night. After that, Andrew joined us again for a couple more rides. And they kept it open a little bit later than that 12 o'clock time, which was when the event was supposed to end. And I thought that was really classy of them. A funny moment occurred when we were on the voyage that night. Now, on the first night, we noticed there was a ride operator who checked Alex's restraints, and his name was Alex. And I was like, oh, Alex, what's his name? And they had a little bond there that was very cute. On the second night, Alex was still there, but then the ride operator who was on my side was named Adam. And I was like, oh, that's funny. You're Adam, I'm Adam, and there's Alex, and he's Alex. And then I said... If there's someone named Andrew on this crew, I'm going to lose it. And both of them pointed to the operator booth and said, there's Andrew there. And so we all laughed and then took a, a great group photo that you can see on our Twitter account. It was just a kind of a funny moment and just exemplifies what Holiday World is all about. Well, that leads us to one of the most emotional experiences that I've had, certainly in a theme park. Dan Miller, a good friend of ours and a member of this group of coaster enthusiasts that we meet throughout the country, had bid and won in an auction the right to the last ride of the night. He decided to dedicate this to Elaine Jackson, a good friend, a member of our group. Now, Andrew and I had only met her once at King's Dominion last year, and she tragically passed away at way too early of an age. And it left a hole in our group, a loss that all of us felt. Our friend Dwayne from CoasterAddict.com called her his better half for a long time. And on his website, there is a really nice memorial to her and a beautiful video that he has on the website that you can go check out. And so Dan set this up that all of us in the group would have this last ride. And after everyone was cleared out, we came on from the exit ramp and they allowed us a moment of silence and a very classy move. We left the first row open as that was Elaine's favorite seat. The ride ops said a very nice fitting memorial to us and were very respectful about the whole thing. As we got to the top of the lift hill, they stated this ride is in memory of Elaine Jackson and it was just a very spiritual moment, very powerful and everyone felt like it was the fastest the voyage ever went. We got back to the station and there was just this feeling of camaraderie and it was just a special moment that I think we'll always remember. It was very, very powerful. It's probably the best night ride I've ever been on but just a regular ride, I still like Legend better. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the one of those things that you feel the voyage is the better coaster, but the legend is your favorite. And I can completely understand that. Yeah. Absolutely. So after our last ride, we all headed to the exit and just had a nice discussion about how powerful that moment was and just kind of talked about the whole two-day experience and how amazing it was. It was really kind of sad to leave as we just had the most amazing time. As we were heading out, there was a huge group of people there awaiting us, employees who said good night, thanks so much for coming. On the first night, they gave us commemorative pins. On the second night, the T-Rex was there to say goodbye to us. It was kind of a neat way to end the night, having a lot of the people there. And you can't forget Sam. Who's Sam? Uh, I think another mascot. What is Sam like? Uh, I think he might be a crocodile. Crocodile Sam? Yeah. Special Sam. Maybe. Yeah, kind of cool. Just a couple things that make this park so special. Now, it's interesting how family-friendly this park was. We didn't come close to doing all the rides. There were a lot of things we still wanted to do, but we did a lot. 
amazing to have a park that has three of the most intense wooden coasters that you'll ever ride that pretty young kids can do but are still fun and exciting, yet there are so many family fun rides that little kids can do as well. And so you have that contrast, really intense, exciting rides, but things that the whole family can do. And as we talked about, Andrew and I said, it is now our favorite park. And more so than just loving the park, it's the people as well. We've formed bonds not only with other enthusiasts there, but the employees that we're gonna share forever. What are your final thoughts, bud? Holiday World is a great park with great employees. The employees that we met, they were just great with taking their time to do stuff with us. And they were really nice about it. They didn't just say, oh, let's just get the interview over with. They were really nice about it. And we saw a couple other people do interviews with them, and they were just so nice about it. Yeah, with them, you really know that they're the same way if they were doing interview or just talking to you face to face. So definitely check them out. Holiday World Podcast, subscribe to them. Such a fun show. They have a lot of interesting things they talk about, and it's a show that you'll fall in love with. And for those of you who live far away from the Midwest, whether you're on the coast, whether you're international, I say it with absolute certainty. Go to that park. It is an amazing experience, unlike anything that we've ever done. And we are now friends for life. We're going to try to get back there every single year. It would be something we'd be sad to miss, as we now feel like we are part of the Holiday World family. It is my favorite park that I have ever been to. It's just the best park to go to. Whether you're an old couple or a very new family, it's just a great park to go to. So once again, we thank all of you at Holiday World for making this event and our time there the most special one ever. If you'd like to check out some of our experiences on Twitter, you can check us out at Adam at Theme Park Fam. You can find us there as we post some pictures there. On Facebook, we're at Theme Park Families. You can find us there as well. And now that we're officially on iTunes, certainly you can subscribe to us there. If you want to throw a happy review for us, that would be appreciated. And as we go along, we'll eventually love to hear some MP3s from voices of all ages on different topics. So be listening for that as we'll ask for plenty of interaction. You can also email us at themeparkfamilies at gmail.com. That's themeparkfamilies at gmail.com. So be on the lookout for episode four, which should be coming out here really shortly with a lot of exciting things to talk about as well. Thanks for listening. You know Santa's there, so you better not pout. Holiday World Smile. See you next time. Andrew out.